I'm starting the assembly with something fun. I don't know why, but I've always loved the look of that classic fender plate on the British bikes, so it's a definite must, and that's where we're kicking off. The first major component going in is gonna be the gearbox. Now, I'm visualizing how it's gonna go in. It's a bit tricky. The book makes it sound simple. I just wanna make sure I'm not gonna damage that gearbox and waste all the work that was put into it. I'll be completely honest, once the gearbox was in, the rest of the assembly around it was very straightforward and simple. Continuing with being honest, I am my own worst enemy where the engine was assembled on the bench to be able to leak test it and make sure that everything functioned. It makes it that much more difficult to put into the frame because of how it's split and the motor mounts needing to be on the casing. But just like the gearbox, once the engine was in, the rest of the assembly and mounting was very straightforward. And with that, the clock and my back are telling me that that's it for tonight. The primary drive covers are unique to the TRW because Triumph designed them to be modular so that you could swap the engine out without having to pull everything apart. I get that, it makes sense, but because of the risk of leaking, I'm gonna use Loctite 518 to seal that up. And I'll use the primary cover to make sure that the 518 dries nice and true. Four hours later, and with a lot of parts cleaned, the primary cover removed, it's time to assemble the clutch basket. When I first pulled the clutch basket apart back in September, there were a number of places that I found that had corrosion from fluid not being able to reach. So to prevent that from happening again, I'm gonna paint on the same fluid that the primary case is gonna be filled with, and that is automatic transmission fluid. In order to make sure that the clutch pressure plate sits true, I love using this little setup with a toothpick and any part of the plate that's offset, you will definitely hear. A few quick adjustments, check it again, and that pressure plate is nice and even, and that's the clutch basket. While cleaning and inspecting the rear sprocket before installing the rear chain, I heard this unmistakable sound. That faint ping came straight out of the hub and on a stationary wheel. I knew what it was, but I didn't want to know what it was. And this by far has scared the crap out of me more than anything else with this bike. Without the wheel being hung up on the frame, the momentum of the tire itself wasn't there to motivate that spindle to turn, so you can see it fight both forwards and backwards. So this again was pointing to what I was worried about that was going on inside the hub, more specifically with those roller bearings. Once I pulled the spindle and looked inside the hub, I could see them. The nine rollers from the roller bearing had crapped themselves out of the cage, and we're stuck with what little grease was left inside the hub. So, with one roller bearing gone, I definitely don't trust the other one, even though the bike had almost no miles on it, age does its thing, and I should have known better back in September. The hunt's gonna be on for more bearings, but the best thing that I could do this night was just simply clean up and call it. We'll start again tomorrow. I was lucky enough to be able to source bearings and dust covers out of the UK, and while they're being fast-tracked, my focus went back to the primary side. 
Because I pulled the stator out of the primary cover in order to clean and inspect both, upon installation I need to make sure I still have 8 thousandths of an inch clearance between the six coils of the stator and the rotor. Uh, luckily no adjustments were needed and so the primary cover assembly was taken off, everything was cleaned up, 518 was applied, and then the cover was put back on, screwed down, and given time to cure. I wanted to have some fun with the oil tank. Now normally the oil level is a decal that you put on, but given the look of this bike there's no way that decal would have survived. So by using some dry transfer stencils, I put on where the minimum oil level was supposed to be, and with the help of some sandpaper, about 3000 grit gave it that weathered look to let it match up with the 27. With the oil feed line connected back to the engine, it was a good time to call it a night. It was definitely better than the previous one. Of all the carburetors that found themselves on Triumph motorcycles, the Solex is one that doesn't get the credit that it deserves. It's not as fancy as an ML carburetor. It is definitely not as complicated as some of the other ones. It is the simplicity and resilience that this carburetor has and how it survives everything that could be thrown at it, including water. It just doesn't quit. So this one, I wanted to give every bit of treatment that I could. It was stripped down, every piece was meticulously gone over and then reassembled, made ready for however many miles I'm gonna be taking this bike down the road for. With that Solex now at home on the back of that side valve engine, a quick check of the throttle cable to make sure that there's no binding inside of it. And with the action nice and smooth, that is the end of the night. And soon, those bearings and dust caps should be here. Three days, I cannot believe that they got here in only three days. And so with that, out go the old and in with the new bearings, dust caps, and every piece that I could salvage after inspecting was refurbished or if not, then it was replaced because I am not taking any chances with this again.
After giving the brakes a check to make sure that those new shoes aren't binding up at all, rotating the wheel and hearing nothing. I am much better off than where I was a few nights ago and it's back to installing that rear chain. With that, that's the major assembly done. All right. This is the last night this bike's gonna be on the bench. Wicked. <laughs>